Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game faction release hot take and profile analysis video. In this video we'll be talking about Torchlight Brigade, which is the newest sectoral part of O12 to arrive in Infinity the Game, and which as of just a couple of days ago we have spoiled profiles by Corvus Belly, possibly subject to change, but covering all of the units that are available to Torchlight, which means we can now build relatively complete lists and talk about, with relative completeness, all of the units that are available to the faction. In this video, we'll be going through those profiles one by one, talking about what they're good for, how they might fit into lists, which ones are good, which ones maybe are a little bit weaker, and then just broadly, what I expect Torchlight Brigade to play like. This is very much a hot takes video. I have had zero games with Torchlight Brigade at time of recording, and although I've looked at these profiles a little bit before this video, really this is just a first time looking at them with any kind of depth, and we'll be going through them and giving my initial impressions. I do hope to get a Torchlight game up maybe in the next couple of days, but for now, let's just have a look at the profiles. First though, who are Torchlight Brigade? So we have a little bit of their background and essentially Torchlight Brigade are, and they're quoted as being a dormant project fed with reserved funds. But what they are is they are the front line on unexplored or new territories in the human sphere. So when humanity expands out to a new planet and there is a need for law enforcement, and protection of remote settlements, that's the duty statement of Torchlight Brigade, which is interesting for a couple of reasons. So the first reason that's interesting is that these are not like a super soldier project. Although they look and play as a fairly elite, particularly well-equipped army, they're not Space Marines, which is interesting because they look visually quite a lot like Space Marines. But the actual narrative of them is very much as kind of like a heroic intervention force with an emphasis on pushing out the boundaries of the human sphere. And that is interesting because it implies that the human sphere is expanding, which is something that has not happened in Infinity's narrative really for some time. So much of the Infinity narrative to date was around basically the existential threat of the combined army that the idea of Brave New Worlds, for want of a better term, was something just didn't really fit into the setting. And so with now the like, you know, tension, the vague detente between humanity and the combined army, the concilium events, things that are happening during the current ITS season, there is the potential in the story for frontier worlds. And that is a super cool, potentially explorable space that the Torchlight Brigade brings into the narrative. So big fan of that. Who do I think the Torchlight Brigade's target audience is? I think there are basically, mechanically and narratively, there are a few different target audiences for Torchlight Brigades. Torchlight Brigade. The first and kind of obvious one is, look at them, right? They, they look a lot like Ultramarines. And if you are the kind of person that actually likes that, right? The Greco-Roman, the blue and gold, the good guy power armor vibe, then they are good for you. And I'm just going to make a little bit of a carve out point here and say, I really like that. I don't think the Space Marine aesthetic is for everyone, but it is for some people. And the people who like that really like that. And as a design adage, particularly for something like an Infinity Sectoral Army, which is a sub-force as part of a larger force, you don't want to build something that everybody likes kind of a little bit. You want to make something that a few people like a lot. Because then you do that enough times, and you have a game where anyone can find something that they really like, rather than it just being a bland melange of science fiction tropes. And so, yeah, you might be the kind of person who has chosen to define themselves as not playing Games Workshop games and Space Marines are for Games Workshop players, which means that Torchlight Brigade is probably not for you. But for the people that it is for, they will really like it. I am not going to buy miniatures for Torchlight Brigade, I don't think, but I am happy to see them in the setting narratively and aesthetically. And to be frank, I think they do a good enough job of differentiating themselves from the exact Games Workshop sci-fi space marine tropes that they are their own infinity thing, just with some of those Greco-Roman vibes that frankly fit pretty well within O12. So from a vibe perspective, that's their target audience. Mechanically, how do I think they play? Mechanically, I think you are the target audience for Torchlight Brigade. If you are either an invincible army or military orders player who wished your faction didn't suck, which is kind of an indictment on those two factions. But historically, we look at how heavy infantry sectorals have been designed for Infinity. They have typically been designed conservatively and with flaws. And it really speaks to the fact like Invincible Army are probably not the best way to play massed heavy infantry in Yuqing. 
military orders have had perennial issues. Like, you can absolutely win with those factions, but they are factions with a deep problem set, it's problem set that arises from conservative design, where they are the heavy infantry factions, so we have to give them vulnerabilities or weaknesses or absences of capability. And Invincible Army is really like this. Invincible Army is good for basically one thing, which is yeeting a mediocre HI fire team forward with a ton of orders. And once it's done that, it has spent its strength. Yes, you can do some things around the edges with Invincible Army to try and paper over the cracks, but that's basically all that it does. It is not a fantastic sectoral, although it is a straightforward sectoral. Torchlight Brigade takes a lot of the power fantasy of both Invincible Army and Military Orders, but does it really well. The top end for Torchlight, in terms of trying to do what those two factions do, may actually be a little bit lower. For example, I am relatively sure that Torchlight is going to have fewer orders, generally, to fuel through its heavy infantry link team if it's trying to play like Invincible Army, and it's going to, for example, have considerably worse tags if it's going to try and play like military orders. But what Torchlight Brigade can do is give you the power fantasy of the heavy infantry super cool hero dudes while having an absolute ton of meat on the bones. One of the things that we will see through this review is that the like 15, 14 to 17, like 15 point troop slot in Torchlight Brigade is fucking stacked. And what that means is you can have all of your super cool hero dudes and also have a baseline of capability that can get you through a game when the big hero dudes need saving. So I, I think this is a very interesting sectoral. I think it is very well designed. I think we do have to acknowledge that the top end of it is not necessarily going to be as focused as some of the sectorals that it will be compared to, but it more than makes up for that and I think is a more powerful sectoral overall than those immediate competitors because the baseline of capability and the ability to play to 15 troops with good like middle range, low weight options that can support the big heroes seems very strong. They're also able to do things in a few different directions. They are by no means bound to one archetype, like especially Imperial Invincible Army is. And that is worth noting as well. I've, I've only written, like I've written exactly one list, but writing that one list was an exercise in cutting a bunch of things that I want and I think can direct me in other, in other directions. So list building, I think for them will at least initially be quite interesting as well. I am broadly optimistic mechanically about this sectoral. So this is the unit AVA chart for Torchlight Brigade. And before we go through all of the unique units in Torchlight Brigade and like the linkable stuff and the new stuff, I want to just call out some of the things that we won't be touching on because they're being inherited from O12 and the profiles have been brought to public for a long time, but which will be relevant, I think, to how Torchlight Brigade want to play. Firstly, they have the usual full complement of links, but they have a lot of, sorry, of units of remotes, etc. But I want to say they have exactly one of the seven point flash pulse remotes and no more. That, however, is fine. I think the idea with the design idea with Torchlight Brigade, as I noted, is that the meat is all sitting at about the 15 point level. And that includes things like Ment Agents, for example. So we've got Ment Agents, we've got Kappa Units, and we've got Raven Eye, all in low availability, but these are going to be useful tools in the army. Kappa Units are linkable in Torchlight Brigade, and I think the standout Kappa Unit will often be the 12 point hacker. That's armed with the submachine gun. It is very, very cheap for a hacker. You will often find yourself taking that in lists if you need a discount option. Raven Eye officers at 12 points are also basically very good cheerleaders that add a mine layer with electromagnetic mines to your deployment zone and can be a lieutenant. Two is the magic number there because if you want to take one as your LT, you have one and a decoy. However, you may choose to run an aggressive lieutenant because with Ment agents, you have access to at 15 points, the cheapest chain of command in the game which opens up some potential around running, for example, aggressive lieutenants. We have a few other options here as well that are worth talking about. Vidox, if you get, so in the, we'll see the sectoral link chart in a moment. Vidox are linkable, but it mentions Vidox um, FTOs. If the Vidoc NCO Doctor is linkable, that is something that will be potentially very useful. If the FTO choices are like weird or, or bad, then disregard, obviously. Otherwise, Jackbrutes are not particularly good, but Psychops are, and I believe Psychops are linkable as well, although I don't think they will play into the fantasy of the list particularly well. I think you'll be able to use them, but they won't necessarily be what you're looking for in this particular case. 
Hippolyta is both linkable and she counts as a true trooper for the links that she will be joining, which means she won't break fire team coherency bonuses, which she is very expensive, but that is potentially very powerful. And then we have diggers, beast hunters, war cores, like basic good filler stuff, although only AVA1. In the list I'm going to try out first, I think I will take at least a digger. I may also take a beast hunter, we will see. Because those are known quantities, although I don't think they're necessarily essential, they will be things that you can put into a list to kind of just round out that lower level points cost stuff and give you plenty of points left over for all of the cool things. So this is the fire teams chart. I will actually keep this on the on the screen for the remainder of the video because it is important to how we choose to analyze the rest of the profiles. But some important things to note, we have uh, a big core that is quite viable. We have the silver star keyword um, that will be applying if you take silver star rovers, hellblazers and wave riders. And importantly, either Sonia LaCroix or Hippolyta that will give you a potential five man pure core. So that is going to be one of the ways that you can run the invincible army style pure core, which we'll talk more about when we get to the Silver Star Rovers. Now, it doesn't tell us here how many cores and harises we are allowed. I am going to just assume that it is one core, one harise, unlimited duos, and that there isn't any extra play in this case. But if there is the option to run, say, two harises and one core, that opens up some interesting Toha style lists that I would definitely be interested in playing. In terms of our wild cards, we can see Psychops, which are good, but I don't necessarily think will fit the power fantasy of the list. Stormbots are potentially interesting. We'll get to those in a moment. Jackboots, I do not like at all. Vidox, I like if the FTO allows you to take the Doctor. And then we have Hippolyta, and Hippolyta is an absolute banger if you can just find the points for her. Ment Agents are also uh, wild cards in this particular list, which means that if you wanted to slap a Ment Agent into just to fill out a Harris bonus, for example, you could. But because they are chain of like they are chain of command cheap models, I would kind of prefer them just to be sitting in the backfield being chain of command insurance. Not something I would normally do because I find that to be kind of an expensive use of a troop slot and the points, but for 15 points, I'm totally willing to do that. So from here, we've got the Torchlight Brigade AVA on the right. Let's just change that to the Lynx. There we go, Lynx. And we'll have our unit that we're looking at on the left. We're going to go through our, our medium infantry first, then our heavy infantry, then our tag, then our remotes, or approximately in that order, uh, in the way that it would be uh, if I was looking at it in Infinity Army. Something interesting to note, and I only figured this out when I was organizing these cards, uh, there are no light infantry being released. Literally the entire sectoral in terms of new releases is either medium infantry, heavy infantry, remote, or tag. And that means that our first cab off the rank are the Nimrods. Not sure why they're called that. That's an interesting name, but they are a wetworks department. Nimrods are linkable in the mobility fire team only alongside Kludgers, where they do not have a keyword, Kludger in this case being mobility, but I don't think keywords are important in Harry's teams anyway. All it would really give you is access to a relatively weak discover bonus. It's not particularly important. I think the mobility fire team generally is probably one of the weaker, more janky things in Torchline. These these profiles, particularly the Nim like the Nimrods, there are things there that you can look at and go, oh, that's cool. This is a 6-2 super jump model with an MSV2 and mimetism. And super jump with the six inches of movement. Yeah, and it's ballistic skill 13, which is actually pretty good when you stack all of those mods. And it's got an AP shock, AP shock marksman rifle, effectively. But ultimately, this is a single wound trooper in a faction that, as far as I know, has no significant access to smoke. Hippolyta is the most notable, and she has Eclipse, not regular smoke. So you're not, we'll, we'll see if this changes as I go through the profiles, but you are not going to be smoke shooting with this model, which means that it is what you get on the 10. It is best case scenario, burst 4, BS 13, Mimetism 2, Super Jump, uh, with one wound. So for 31 points, I do not like paying 31 points for a single wound model. This is kind of classic medium infantry bloat. And I think the hidden deployment profile is probably very janky. Yes, it's got forward deployment and hidden deployment, but it does not have camouflage, which means that if you want a surprise attack, you're popping out of hidden deployment to attack. And at only eight inches of forward deployment and with only a submachine gun, that is not going to get you very far. So I think out the gate, our first medium infantry in alphabetical order, or at least in order that the things were presented to me, this is not a good profile. I think it is trying very hard to be cool, but unlike a lot of the things in the sectoral, it is not succeeding. 
potentially considerably more interesting is Sonia Lacroix, another medium infantry, glow pole marshal, I assume that is global police, but we'll have to see. She's got a mix of tools that is doing its level best to compensate for the fact that she is also an expensive single wound medium infantry. But, okay, Albedo is the first red flag, and I, I don't think I've ever seen a profile with Albedo that justified the existence for Al of Al Albedo, and it, it's not starting now. But that is not really what Sonya is about. Sonya is a pure link NCO, and there are actually only a few ways to get an NCO into, and this is one of the things that will differentiate the um, this faction from Invincible Army, is that you don't get to like trivially slap an NCO with a Lieutenant plus one order behind it into your core link. If you want your NCOs, you have to work a little bit harder for it, and that is even if we get access to the Vidox, if the Vidox NCO profiles are playable, they break link bonuses. So if you want an NCO in the Silver Star Fire team, I think you're looking at Sonya Lacroix. Now I'm not sure that's necessarily essential, but if you if you want it, that's what you're looking at. The other potential for her is I actually think she might be viable as an LT choice. Now there are a few ways to spend kind of more SWC than you normally would in this faction. And, and that's in particular if you want to start getting into things like the, the Stormbots with the HRLs and then trying to buff them with Evo Hackers and you still take your Mine Layer remotes. We'll cover all of this soon. If you want to start doing all of that stuff and still have some big guns, there might genuinely be some merit in paying only 28 points for a plus one SWC Lieutenant option. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be good, but look, you have a 15 point chain of command. You can kind of afford to take the risk. And it's not like she's doing nothing in a link team. She has just barely okay close combat stats and she has stealth. And look, you're not really going to be blowing up the world with her, trying to shoot with her with that X-Visor and the multi-rifle, but she will at least have core link bonuses. And there may be a time and place where the anti-material, if nothing else, is useful. I do think a lot of, if, if you take Sonya a lot of the time, it is going to be as part of like a jank play that probably just barely works. But that is totally okay, right? Like if, if jank exists, but it is just good enough to be playable. That is that is the spice of life in list construction. And I think that is where Sonya sits. As with, look, running theme, expensive, nearly 30 point medium infantry, they are never going to get the A plus seal of approval, but there is just enough going on with Sonya that we might see her combination of tools, probably not Albedo, but the particularly the Lieutenant or the NCO options may be getting some play in some interesting and niche circumstances. And the model is probably pretty cool. The profile picture I particularly like. Our next medium infantry is we have our medium infantry doctor and engineer. More stealth, more terrain total. That's kind of interesting. Armor 2, BTS 6, Ballistic Skill 13 and Mimetism is notable, but they are kind of paying out the nose for it. Fighting medium infantry are not necessarily bad, but again, let's bear in mind they have a single wound and there are a lot of points that can get taken down kind of easily by a shotgun. Cludgers can nominally go in the mobility fire team link, but I do not think that is really going to be their home. I think their home is going to be as an engineer duoed with a wrecker. Wreckers as tags are potentially kind of interesting, but the way that their profile is laid out is probably going to be particularly valuable having, having a whip 14 engineer following them around. And because among other things, a wrecker is a remote presence tag with just one of the little remotes inside. So a WIP-14 engineer who can do a variety of classifieds and also repair the remote and the remote has remote presence, that is kind of a nice synergy. And at 6.2 speed, it's slower than the tag, but it is just fast enough to keep up. So that is where I think I see Kludgers seeing play. I do not see them, even the Doctor, if, if the Vidoc... Uh, doctor profile is is playable, then I see it maybe joining a heavy infantry Harris, but I don't think I see the Kludger Doctor joining any of the heavy infantry teams unless there is no other way to get a Doctor into those links. And frankly, at that point, you may just start playing paramedics instead. It's what Invincible Army does and it works kind of okay for them. So this is probably the first of the medium infantry that we've seen that has some potential. They are expensive, right? These are expensive pieces. These are not on the same level as like Neo Terra's blades, that's that is some some top shelf link with a tag kind of engineer situation. But there are just enough edges here. In particular, Web 14 is like enough of an edge. The 6-2 movement, the fact that look in a pinch it can kind of gunfight, although you don't really want it to, that gives the Cludger some play. 
Our final medium infantry, and this one we have, this has some serious potential, are the Wave Riders Cyber Combat Team. Now, noticing again we're seeing more of a theme, stealth and terrain total. We have Mimetism minus three and Ballistic Skill 12, surprisingly okay CC. And then we have Boarding Shotguns and Submachine Guns, Pitches, Decharges, Explosive CCWs, and a variety of upgraded hacking profiles. Now, I have had a number of people, I have seen them respond quite negatively in the sense of, oh, new stuff is better than my stuff kind of response, and yeah, probably actually it is. If I was going to compare this, the, the obvious comparison, and let's just remember, remind ourselves that comparison is the thief of joy, um, but the obvious comparison with Wave Riders for me is actually with the Dartok Cyber Combat Unit. Uh, that's in Morats, and Dartok, I would say, are hands down better. Like, they are just at the role they're trying to fulfill, Dartok are notably superior to wave riders. They are veterans, they are dogged, and they combine on one profile all of the hacking programs that you would want by combining, they have Trinity on a regular hacking device. On top of that, they are cheaper, not by a lot, but they are cheaper, which means that just like, look, hands down, in the role, the specific role of hacker that is linked to a heavy infantry team, these guys are not as good as Dartox. But that does not mean they're bad. I think they are probably very, very good. And there are a few things that the sort of will edge them out into, like ahead of the Dartok in the comparison. Despite the fact that they fall behind overall, they have some edges. And one of those edges is Ballistic Skill 12. Now the Mimetism, yes, they have a submachine gun. Theoretically, they can shoot. They're a little harder to be shot. Nothing wrong with that. They also have Armor 3, BTS 6. Armor 3 is surprisingly high. And BTS 6 on a hacker is obviously very, very useful. Um, but the... The Ballistic Skill 12 is very pertinent. My personal experience is that every point of Ballistic Skill matters a lot when you are using a pitcher, and whether you have these guys in a little Harris or in a big team, that extra point of Ballistic Skill goes a very long way. Pitchers are a piece, a, a weapon that cannot afford to cannot afford to miss. It's just too painful to miss with a pitcher. And every time I use a Ballistic Skill 11 compared to every time I use a Ballistic Skill, skill 12 pitcher, like I notice my, my bereeds hit on 15s in Hacker's Lamb way too often and it you really feel it and for that reason plus the fact that they have stealth that's particularly nice plus the fact that it's 16 movement they keep with us to their team right that's like a little edge these are these are good like these are absolutely good hackers they are not best in class but they don't need to be to be very good because there are other things that this faction has going on that is particularly potent so this is the first medium infantry unit that gets a full-on like look this is a straight a unit for me you will see these in lists you may even see two of these in some lists they're just expensive enough that fitting two of them is a little challenging if you told me you were going to put two in a list i would have no doubt that you were you were being correct in doing so Obviously also, haven't mentioned this, but they are a Silver Star for the purposes of the Silver Star Fire Team, and that is particularly pertinent because it means that they can slot comfortably into a five-person link, enjoy the full bonuses of the link without breaking the link's um, bonuses, duh, uh, which, which means that you can slot in a specialist, a hacker, take advantage of a tin bot, and at 22 points at the cheapest, 24 points for the next cheapest. That is not too expensive to have a solid weight HI link comprised of, for example, things like Silver Star Rovers, on which point. Silver Star Rovers are our first heavy infantry and they are line troops. Now, these guys are very, very, very much just Invincible Army, Terracotta Soldier, Zhu Yong Invincibles. They are, they are like, can I copy your homework? Yep, change it a little bit so that the teacher doesn't notice. Slap Sync Robco Roman influencers on there, and you have Silver Star Rovers. The profiles are nearly identical, like they're colossally similar, but there are a few pertinent differences that are worth making note of. In the general profile list, so these these weapon options down here, there is a lot that is very, very similar, but there are light riot stoppers on a few pieces, which are, re like having template weapons on your HI link is kind of nice to have. Zuyong have breaker pistols, whereas Silver Star Rovers have heavy pistols, and of the two, I think I would prefer the heavy pistol, plus one burst, obviously, comparable across both of those regiments. And then we have things like Takaway and HMG, very similar to the um, profiles that are available to the Zuyong Invincibles. The notable differences, and, and where it becomes something that you can actually compare the two regiments, is firstly, the Tinbot Silver Star has a worse Tinbot than these Tinbot Zuyong. From memory, the Zuyong's Tinbot is minus six, and when you're doing things like 
putting, say, hacker wave riders in linked teams with silver stars, or even just trying to penetrate an enemy hacking network just generally, that does add up. Now, for Zuyongs, it's more important to have the Tinbot minus six because a lot of the, like, if you're running Invincible Army, Zuyongs, you are just face checking enemy repeaters and it sucks. So, minus six Tinbot is like all of the defense that you basically have. Whereas the Torchlight Brigade has a lot more options for going in after things like, say, Masai Morans. So, it's less important that you have the Tinbot minus six, but it would still have been nice to have. The other change that's notable is that Silver Star Rovers compared to Zhu Yong Invincibles, they lose number two, but they gain Specialist Operative. Now, in a vacuum, this is a very good change because it means that you can run like Haris teams really comfortably and just, yeah, you got your Specialists in there. It's fine. doesn't matter. Like whatever you put in the link team, you got Specialists. You're covered. It gives you a lot of flexibility in how you want to run things because these guys can do the objectives for you. But number two in a team like, say, Zhu Yong Invincibles, is not without merit. If you're doing something like putting Zuyong paramedics in the core link, what you get to do is you get to keep all of your link bonuses on the paramedic as he goes and attempts to revive your downed HI because your HMG has eaten a missile or something. And yes, you may have to spend a command token to reform the link back to full that turn if you don't want to wait for the downed revived Zuyong to rejoin the link, but it's a much more efficient paramedic attempt which makes Zuyong paramedics viable. I am reluctant to rely on paramedics in Silver Star Rovers because they don't have that same advantage. If in active turn you eat some kind of a weapon or an ARO that breaks your link, you're down to just having that baseline paramedic try and single shot a Silver Star on Fizz 12, and that is not nearly good enough. Now, fortunately, there are some good doctors. You've got other options. You can just fight on. You can build a Silver Star link that, you know, just, just all of the dudes fight, and that's totally fine. But it is it is a notable point of difference between um, Zhu Yong Invincibles and Silver Stars. Otherwise, in terms of differences, there's a lack of a boarding shotgun here, which is something that I would kind of like, but don't worry, we'll make up for that on some other profiles, particularly when we get to the Hellblazers, which we'll see soon. But broadly, look, uh, it says AVA3. I assume that means that there will be AVA3 in Vanilla. They are AVA5 in the Torchlight Brigade, and I can see lists that run two or three of those as the basis of a five-person link very comfortably. This is good meat and potato stuff. These guys are totally fine. They will give you your big tactical awareness link, and I am here for them. They are not exciting, but they are foundational, and for that reason, as part of the baseline, when you go out and you buy the Torchlight Brigade box, these guys, you get them, you paint them, and you will put them in plenty of lists, which means that they are ideal as a kind of HI line troop. They're following the Zuyong Invincible model. The Zuyong Invincible model works. It's the context in which the Zuyong sit that often lets them down, not the profiles themselves. So yeah, big fan of Silver Star Rovers, particularly when they are linked with things like Wave Riders and Hellblazers. So Hellblazers is when we get to the spice, in like the particular spice of the linkable options in Torchlight Brigade. These guys, and also look, frankly, this this face here, look, this is this is a space marine, right? These, I don't know what you, these implants, I assume the Games Workshop hasn't copyrighted them uh, and Power Sword and stuff, but like this is where we get particularly space marine-y. And if you like these guys visually, then you like the faction visually, and that's totally fine. Now, in terms of profiles, these are... Decently started, frenzied, close combat, heavy infantry, which means that they, they are good, basically. If you can link these and run these forward with a gun in the same link team, you have the basis for a useful unit. For my money, I think these guys compete very closely with Tankos, and frankly, competing very closely with Tankos is a really good place to be. I think, tentatively, I would prefer Tankos. In terms of that particular comparison, Tankos have Berserk, which is really, really good, um, but Tankos have monofilament weapons, which are temperamental. They can be outstanding, but when you're fighting like opposing single wound or even two wound pieces, monofilament sometimes is like, oh, you rolled a 13 again. Yeah, let's spend another order. Whereas Hellblazers have an explosive CCW and enough martial arts that it will do some damage. Explosive CCWs are also anti-material, which sometimes matters. So I yeah, look the between the two of them, look, they're both they're both excellent and being as good as Tankos at being a linked power unit, that is an excellent place to be. I think there is one clear standout profile here, and that is the Light Shotgun Flam and Spear profile. Um, not only is it the cheapest, but it gives you a template weapon, which you really, like a, a, a Light Shotgun on this unit 
in the Silver Star Fire teams is just it's just perfect. Like it is a perfect weapon because if you round a corner against someone, you are presenting them with either three templates or potentially three dice twenty ones. And three dice twenty ones is a scary face to face roll. On top of that, Flam and Spears gives you a potential long range ARO or single shot long range weapon if you need it. And then they are good in CC. They're as fast as the rest of the link team. They are not world beaters in CC, but CC twenty two with martial arts two is like. That is exactly good enough. That is exactly good enough to punch down into anything without close combat skills, and anything with close combat skills, you just frickin' shotgun. So this is a unit, look, two of these in a five-person Silver Star Fire team is probably the right number. I think three is probably overdoing it because you've got other stuff that you need in that link, but a five-person Silver Star Fire team that aims to deliver two of these as the tip of the spear has a ton going on. In O12, like in vanilla O12, depending on if these are available or not, you may consider running these just unlinked as pseudo, they're just heavy infantry warbands. We've seen Pan Oceania run Teutonic Knights. Now, these guys I do not think are as good as Teutonic Knights. A combination of stats on the Teutons, but like in particular just the fact that the Teutons dodge so well and the context that Teutons exist in, I think Teutons add more value to the list that they are in. But again, like being not quite as good as Teutons or even like just, you know, kind of close to as good as Teutons still makes a unit really, really good, particularly in conjunction, like when you consider them in the context of the broader faction, military orders. I have said already in this video that I think military orders is, is weaker than Torchlight Brigade. Even if they have individually stronger profiles, even if a knight of a Montessa Tikbalang is a better gunfighter than anything in Torch Brigade, even if a Teutonic Knight is a better HI warband than Hellblazers, that's what it, that's literally 100% of what MO has going on in terms of their top end, and the support for those pieces is mediocre most of the time, whereas the support for Hellblazers freaking rocks. And as for like Invincible Army in this comparison, Invincible Army wish they had something like this that they could slap into a link. Invincible Army basically have been sitting there playing their sad fiddle ever since JSA split two editions ago, wishing that they had those kind of models back and they could conscript some Japanese tankos into their links because they would really love that. So Hellblazers, another excellent piece. And again, you buy this in the starter box. It is a foundational element. You get two of them. I think the models slap, but I'm really here for science fiction dudes with swords and shields. Yes, I am a basic bitch. And two of these in the starter box is probably exactly the right number. Collectively, that's given us our basic five-person core link. So Silver Star Rovers, Hellblazers, Wave Riders, potentially Hippolyta. Hippolyta is what you take if you want to add a ton of spice at an expensive premium. But I think something like one Wave Rider, two Hellblazers, and two Silver Star Rovers is probably going to be kind of like where you start if you are looking to just be conservative and play something that you think kind of works. Let's take the Silver Star Rover Tactical Awareness HMG, the Silver Star Rover Tactical Awareness Tinbot, two Hellblazers, and your choice of Wave Rider. That is a five-person link with two TAC Awares, close combat action, hacking, uh, three separate specialists. That and none, nothing is nothing is egregiously expensive for what it does, and it has core link bonuses. Biggest problem is that it has a single gun, and if the Silver Star HMG goes down, you don't have a reliable way of pulling it back. But if the Silver Star HMG has delivered a couple of units to the midfield, and then the Hellblazers can go nuts, you're still in a fine place. Equally notable, though, is the fact that although that is a totally viable way to start a list in Torchlight Brigade, you don't have to, because there are other options. I think you can run Torchlight Brigade as like a nearly all asymmetric list if you want to, and that is one of the things that differentiates it from its immediate competitors, and I think is very interesting. On that note, let's get into some of the other spicy HI profiles. So, talking about potential asymmetric play, we have Strider's Scouting Forward Unit. Uh, this thing is two Libertos in a trench coat, and that is really good. Now, the obvious comparison that this thing kind of wants to make is, oh, look, it's going to be kind of a lot like the Zencha, and it is costed kind of like the Zencha, but frankly, it, it is cheaper, and it is better, and it is genuinely... This is... This is a really good piece. Now, it is expensive enough that you cannot necessarily slap a Strider in every single list, but... Like, just about every one of these profiles potentially has some play, and the good ones have 
a ton of play. So how is it structured? This is a HI skirmisher, which means that it's a pseudo HI. We we have the no wound incapacitation, shock immunity combination, mimetism, camouflage, surprise attack. It is an NCO, which is kind of cool. Not by any means essential, like NCO and fire team obviously is premium. Nothing wrong with having an NCO on a piece like this. And it has forward deployment plus eight. So it's not a true infiltrator, like for example, Essentia is. It's also only ballistic skill 12, but it still has mimetism and surprise attack. And it doesn't have any special mobility skills. However, it makes up for that, more than makes up for that, by having an absolute ton of interesting stuff going on in the profiles. We have a gun option in the form of the Red Fury. We have two separate mine layers. Now, the mine layers are packing submachine guns, which is a very cheap weapon, which is nice. You have camouflage, you can get in range, you can take a fight. Um, they don't have any template weapons to back up the submachine guns, but they are mine layers and specialist operatives. That is a very rare combination where you get to have your cake and eat it too. And you choose at list construction, not at deployment. You get to choose between either shock mines or deployable repeaters. So, do you want to run an Infowar midfield deployable repeater base list? You can. All you have to do, you've got to pay a bunch of points for it. But, and do you know, 28 points for a submachine gun armed camouflage HI specialist operative? Frankly, not too bad. That's, that's kind of pretty good. That can be the basis for an entire separate list archetype. Alternatively, and I think what is probably going to be my jam, is the Forward Observer Light Shotgun Plus One Burst. This is the one that is two Libertos in a trench coat. So you have everything, like th Burst 3, or three dice on 18s is a like template or three dice 18s is a very strong face to face option. And as a model that has two wounds, it can potentially penetrate an enemy like defensive line. It can take a template and it can keep on pushing. The fact that it's only for deployment plus eight rather than true infiltration means that you can't, for example, YOLO it to the DZ. It starts a little further back in most scenarios. But those are acceptable prices to pay, and at 29.0 WC, that is an attractive profile. So I I don't have any of these in the list that I'm going to play that is the like, you know, basic out the gate, let's just try and lean into the obvious faction strengths. Like we're gonna get to have a game maybe on Monday, for example. But I do really, really like this profile, and I especially like the light shotgun, but I also like the mine layers, and I think even the Red Fury potentially has some play in some lists, although it's notably expensive. Striders are another, like, just outstanding regiment, and again, I haven't discussed these units yet, but it's worth noting that in context, Striders are made even stronger. Why are they made even stronger? When we get to, so there are... There are beast hunters in this sectoral, and when we get to them, you will see the, not Stombots, the Moonraker remotes. Consider the Striders in the context of Moonrakers. Uh, when I get to Moonrakers, I will call back to the Striders, because it is in that environment that they continue to operate and are particularly effective. So, second last heavy infantry, we have the Yellow Jacket Transorbital team. These are kind of basic, like these are pretty basic HI style drop troops. We've seen things like this before. There are a few notable differences here though. So firstly they have the they have the pseudo HI kit, so no wound incapacitation and shock immunity. Cool. They are only Fizz 12. That is totally fine. If you want to use these guys legitimately as drop troops, you're probably going to be trying to combine them with an Evo hacker and hope to land on 15s. Now at 25 to 29 points, just hoping to land on a 15 is a pretty scary prospect. And it's also worth noting that as heavy infantry, they are hackable and trying to land in your opponent's DZ is a very, very fast way to expose yourself to hacking AROs. But if you can tolerate that first risk and circumvent that second risk, you have a pretty good package here. So particularly notable is the fact that they have Mimetism minus three in addition to their Ballistic Skill 12, which makes them one of the most serviceable, I think in fact probably the best gunfighter of their type for doing this kind of land in the DZ and do the DZ attack kind of things compared to all of their similar two wound compatriots. So for example, the um, Shooting Star, the Lujing Heavy Infantry, I wanna say it's, I'm not even sure if it's Ballistic Skill 12 or 13, but it lacks, for example, Mimetism. It's better at landing natively, it's got a bunch of other advantages, but it's also considerably more expensive. Uh, other things, I think it's almost worth comparing to a Fractor. A Fractor is unhackable and I think is cheaper, but it does not have mimetism, it can't gunfight as cleanly. In terms of the profiles that we've got access to here, 
I'm, I am always wary of taking a submachine gun on anything that I actually want to do work. I am leaning towards either the boarding shotgun or combi rifle profiles for deployment zone assault. Now, not necessarily perfect. I, I've always got a lot of time for a combi rifle, landing and shooting some things in the back. Boarding shotgun obviously is quite solid. Only ballistic skill 12, but has mimetism. The hacker is expensive and only has a submachine gun. The special operative only has a submachine gun. I don't want to get within eight inches. Like the, the the ideal use case for a piece like this is to land behind something and shoot it in the back or get so close to it that you're engaging within eight inches. You want a combi rifle for engaging someone from behind outside of eight so they have no ARO. And you want a boarding shotgun for engaging something up close so that you can fork them and take advantage of your mimetism and two wounds and the fact that you can probably hit them either way. So I am wary of submachine guns, but if any model can pull off a submachine gun, it is a model that has ballistic skill 12, mimetism minus three. They also have stealth, which might just make a big difference in terms of getting them through things like hacking networks, but you have to not land in the hacking network. If your opponent has like three different repeater remotes, it may be challenging to do that in the DZ. The big thing about yellow jackets is that there is like one or two other profiles in this faction that say, hey, maybe you want to take an Evo hacker. Maybe you want to take an Evo hacker for some other reason. And once you do that, you start opening up drop troops as the overhead, the overhead to sustain the meme becomes lower. And so that I think is the list that will be the home to the yellow jackets where you've you've gone, you know what? I think I think Stormbots are really cool. I'm gonna take them. And I'm going to need an Evo hacker. And okay, well, look, I've taken an Evo hacker. Let's just slap a yellow jacket in there and see if it does something. It's 29 points. I can afford to spend exactly that much on a 0 SWC piece that might just crack the game open. I do not think these guys are outstanding. They are heavy infantry, close assault pieces. You always have to be careful with that. But I do think that they are good. And I think there is exactly one list archetype where they go from being kind of hard to include, even if they're okay, to actually still kind of hard to include but but just close enough to justifiable that we can try to embrace the meme of the hi drop assault last and final heavy infantry is the silver star prime and this guy is the business now let's talk about the very small number of downsides that he has first this is just a chungus hi it is only armor five it is only two wounds it is not for example a gamma trooper gamma trooper walks like a tag Armor six, no winning cap, two wounds, etc. This isn't that. This thing is started much more like, oh, I don't know, let's pick a model, like a Kreeza Borak. And in fact, it is a great deal like a Kreeza Borak from N3 because we have finally, after so many years, the return of what used to be called full auto and is now ballistic skill attack minus three. Now there will be at least one person watching this video that's like, what do you mean? Does that just make them ballistic skill 11? No. How does ballistic skill attack minus three works? How it works is when you declare ballistic skill attack, you impose a minus three penalty on any roll at all your opponent makes in face to face. Are you at close range shooting them at your pistol and they're hacking you? They're at minus three. Are you shooting them and they're dodging? They're at minus three. Are they shooting you back? They're at minus three. Do they have an multispectral visor? Doesn't matter. They're still at minus three. It is a super cool ability. On top of that, they are ballistic skill 14, and they are linkable, and their HMG is damage 16, which falls just barely into the category of can potentially fight a tag. Particularly combined with the fact that they have multispectral visor level 1s, you can get them to burst 5. You can theoretically get them to burst 5 ballistic skill 15, although I am very wary of the idea of putting these guys in a 5-person link. But in a 3-person link, with just a little bit of light support, they are an outstanding firepower supremacy pace. I have an absolute ton of time for these. They are costed more or less appropriately. I think 53 points for these guys is kind of on the cheap side, but only kind of. Um, I look, I loved Kreeza Borax back when they were the old school full auto Kreeza Borax. I love Silver Star Primes. Kreeza Borax, the old Kreeza Borax was like all of the power of a fully linked Silver Star Prime uh, in a single HI packet, whereas the Silver Star, you really do probably, I think, want to link it because the heavy pistol in particular, if you're doing close assault with this guy, the heavy pistol really wants to go to burst three. But if you can get there, then the fact that they have tactical awareness, the fact that they have the MSV-1, these guys really, really cool. Um, they have a shock CCW. I am not shocked that a that a heavy infantry that looks like it's holding a sword in HMG really doesn't want to fight NCC. The sword is just there for looks, but that's okay, rule of cool. 
These guys are easily one of my favorite profiles in the new sectoral, mostly just because I have super strong, like, beloved nostalgia for the old Cruiser Borak, and these guys do that. Now, they don't exist in the same context that the old Cruiser Borak did, because the old Cruiser Borak was surrounded by approximately a million Morlocks, um, but still, I like these guys a lot. I will definitely be using one in my first game with this faction. Last and final heavy infantry releasing as part of Torchlight Brigade, we have Jamie Samus Arantes Netroid Rover. Now, this is a profile that the first time I looked at it, I'm like, oh, it's just Andromeda again. It's crap. Andromeda's bad. But the, the more I look at it, the more I'm kind of excited for this person. Um, I there's There's just enough going on here that actually this is not Andromeda. This is something separate and its own beast entirely. Let's talk about the kind of like the issues that this profile is going to have to grapple with first. It's Silhouette 4. Being Silhouette 4 freaking sucks. Uh, that's actually the biggest one. It's hackable. It's a forward deployment, no marker state, mostly hackable piece. Um, you're going to have to deal with that as well, although it is a colossal BTS 9 and Whip 14. But, but those those are the things that make it similar to Andromeda and made me initially go, yeah, I'm not super interested in this because trying to make like Andromeda when she f when she deploys on your opponent's deployment zone line and then just dogs her way through an entire army, yeah, she's absolutely terrifying. The whole zapper zapper plus D charge with the dog fork is is terrifying. That is not what Jamie is actually about in this particular case, because there are some really notable things that this profile has going on that I think make it a weird and different beast entirely. Firstly, it's a full two wound HI with armor four, BTS nine, and rheumatism. So this thing is this thing is durable, like notably durable. Secondly, and probably most importantly, it's got a freaking plasma rifle. There is no model with a plasma rifle that is bad. Like the, the worst that you can ever say about any model with a plasma rifle is that maybe it's too expensive, kind of. Plasma is a terrifying weapon type. And when this thing is ballistic skill 13, mimetism, and starts in range thanks to forward deployment plus eight, the, the plasma rifle is the freaking source here. Like all of the rest of this stuff, the fact that it's on a silhouette four base and it's going to be really hard to deploy, you've got to find a place to hide it. The fact that it's got guardian, like guardian, I'm going to assume here is guard, that is the ability. That lets you declare martial CC attacks against opponents in zone of control. Like, it's only got a shock CCW, it's only martial arts one, it's only CC22. You will use Guardian from time to time, but like, the plasma rifle is what this profile is about. On top of that, a really major point of difference compared to uh, Andromeda is 6-4 movements. One of the big issues, so Silhouette 4 bases are colossally unwieldy. They need to be very fast to overcome that, just the fact that they just are hard to move around corners. Like, the extra movement it takes to get a Silhouette 4 model around a corner makes trying to move 4-4 four, four Silhouette 4 models, which I think Andromeda may be the only one in the game, apart from fat remotes, like Probots. 4-4 four, four Silhouette 4 models suck to maneuver, but Jamie is not a 4-4 model. They're 6-4, which means that they will actually be able to zip in and around and do things. On top of that, you even have decoy, and this might be the first case of decoy where I'm actually like, no, I'll 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 be happy to have that. Like every conversation I've ever had around Helots where someone has said, I think the decoy version might be better than the camouflage version, is really just like if you need a litmus test for whether or not someone understands Infinity well enough to take advice from, that's the litmus test. Is if they tell you unironically to take decoy helots, you can be like, Okay, cool, thank you very much for your time. I'm gonna put you on mute now. But in this case, like, they could never have given this model camouflage. Like, in no fair universe could Jamie have been given camouflage. It would just not be okay. And, the, like, the next closest kind of, like, decoy is hugely worse. It is hugely inferior to camouflage. But this model is so high value that your opponent will do, like, anything to deal with it before it gets to start taking shots and making itself felt. And that's often going to mean trying to drop a net rock, like trying to drop a pitcher onto it and hack it. And if you've got two of these and there's like they're deployed in a way where there's no easy way to put a pitcher between them, and even if they do put a pitcher between them, they got a split burst on the first hacking attack. Like decoy is actually legitimately kind of useful on this model. And that is the first time I have like ever said that about decoy, apart from maybe on mentors where it's fine i guess so there is like there is just a ton a ton of potential 
going on with this piece. Jamie, look, Jamie is a piece that will win you games and lose you games. Jamie will win you games when they do the things that their profile looks like they are meant to do, and will just be terrifying. Jamie will lose you games when your opponent guesses right or you can't deploy them correctly, and they are 49 freaking points. That is expensive AF. This is a very, very expensive profile. This is within spitting distance of a Silver Star Prime, and a Silver Star Prime will never let you down. Jamie is occasionally going to just be like really difficult to use. You'll just be like, oh, a new person set this table up, and there's nowhere I can put them. They're dead. I guess I'll try and hide them in my DZ, maybe. That's going to happen occasionally. But on the games when Jamie pops off, they are going to be so cool. So I have a lot of time for this profile. It is not probably going to be in the first in the first uh, game that I play with the faction, but it was an effort to cut them in order to afford basic meat and potato stuff that will like actually test the faction out. This is one of my favorite profiles alongside the Silver Star, and only the fact that it is colossally expensive holds me back from salivating more over it than I already am. So with our HI done, let's talk about tags. There is exactly one, the Wrecker Fire Recon Armored Squadron. Uh, this guy is weeb as hell. Uh, this is an extremely anime looking piece of kit. And just as a reminder, if you if you were worried about this game, this faction being too Space Marine-y, don't worry, this Gundam ass thing's got your back. Uh, this is an interesting profile that has already solicited a number of like responses that I, I feel like maybe kind of are wrong. I've seen people, for example, compare this to an Azrael because it has one profile with continuous damage and armor piercing. And it's like my, my, my brother in Christ, this is not an Azrael. Uh, we will talk about that as a comparison, but let's just start with what is, what is the Wrecker bringing to the table? So firstly, it is a Silhouette 6 tag, which is the most lovely of silhouettes for a tag. Just tall enough to vault many things, but just small enough to actually hide behind buildings. It is only Ballistic Skill 13, and that is far and away the biggest downside Achilles heel of the Wrecker. Ballistic Skill 13 is going to take a little bit of work to make do things. Now you can staple an Engineer to this guy, and it has remote presence, and the Engineer is Willpower 14, so it is an easy repair, but you may find yourself repairing it more than you would like. Now, all of its weapons, including its chain rifles, are armor piercing, the usual ballistic skill attack plus one damage. It has tactical awareness, as we would expect. It, you know, it has basic tag things, ECM guided, etc. And it has terrain total, which is kind of nice. Importantly, it is also 6-4 move. And that is that is really important because the comparison I immediately made with this thing is the Shakush, the light armored unit in Hakuslam. The Shakush has more ballistic skill, but it has to choose between an H a H HMG or an AP Spitfire, which is a very hard choice. Whereas the record is not. Whichever of those two profiles you prefer, you can just take and it will have armor piercing. But the big thing for me that consistently holds the Shakush back is that 6-2 movement is genuinely less mobile on like a tack aware piece than 6-4 movement. I am much happier having 6-4 movement and every time I play the Shakush, the fact that it's 6-2 always comes up. It is no more, mo in fact it is less mobile much of the time than an Asawira for example and it is considerably more expensive. The fact that the Silver Star is 6-4 opens up a ton of options for it. It can play mobilely, with the note that there is not really much slash any smoke in this faction, which means that it will often have to gunfight its way forward. I think the HMG is going to be probably the most common profile, with the Ballistic Skill Attack plus one burst HRL being the next in competition. I think the Spitfire is probably going to be the wrong choice most of the time. It is not sufficiently cheap, like it's it's che it's not cheap enough to justify it over the HMG, and it's too expensive to justify it over the HRL. Now, the HRL is the piece that invited comparison to the Azrael Special Deterrence Unit in Hack Islam, and I think that is a terrible comparison. And Azrael is, so firstly, the Wrecker is worse at, worse at winning face-to-face -face roles. Um, it is more, it's considerably more expensive. Um, and the Azrael, the Azrael is not a mobile piece, and Azrael is literally, it's a deterrence unit, where it sits there, and it goes... Remember that that one time we played, and I just stood this up and fought your tag, and your tag died in one go? Do you, do you remember that? Hydra tag. I don't want to fight that. You don't want to fight me. No one wants to fight the Azrael. The Azrael doesn't want to fight anyone. Just sit the hell down. Put your tag in total cover, please. I can play my game. That is what an Azrael is used for, and I clench every time I stand up and actually have to take a face-to-face -face roll, and to be fair, I cheer every time the damn thing actually wins and kills something. But that is a performance profile that you can accommodate on a 40-point heavy infantry surrounded by like 5 and 6 and 8-point irregulars. That is how Hack Islam operates. And Azrael is cheap, surrounded by cheap things. A Wrecker is not. 
to to you if you are using a Wrecker HRL, like yes, it does pose a threat to tags because it is both a template and an armor piercing weapon. But you you must be active with this. You cannot afford a fifty one point piece that has a twenty something point engineer probably stapled to it. That cannot sit still. Once you are more than forty points, or even frankly, once you are forty points in any faction but Hack Islam, you do not have the luxury of sitting still and doing nothing. The Wrecker must be doing things, but it has the option to do so because it is six four tack aware it is the what i see the hrl as being particularly good for is firstly it is at least nominally a threat to anything although god help it it has to fight something with limitism minus six what it wants to do is use that mobility to push forward drag that engineer along with it and do some objectives and find spicy template hits at silhouette six six four move tack aware you you can find the line that gets you the shot that clips multiple things if it exists and at burst three, ballistic skill 13, it's not going to light the world on fire, but it is just good enough to land that like one template that then is armor piercing to be, to be scary. That is what I see the role of the HRL. And when it's not doing that, it is a serviceable arrow piece. It's got courage, it's got armor six, BTS nine, three structure. It can, it can probably risk taking exactly one gunfight, but anyone who has played an overdrawn for any length of time will tell you that being Ballistic Seal 13 on a tag sucks and you feel it. Now, this thing is cheap enough that it makes up for it. I am not rushing to put Wreckers in any of my lists, but I think you need to be like, if you, if you are willing to tolerate their weaknesses and leverage their strengths, they're pretty solid. I am probably going to be leaning towards Silver Star Primes even to fight enemy tags before I lean to this thing, but it is close. Sometimes you just need AP rounds, and that means the, that means the Wrecker. They're a very useful tool for the faction to have, and if you would like to have Tack Aware in both combat groups, never mind O12 Prestige this season, uh, having a Wrecker in combat group 2 in particular, alongside a bunch of other regular orders and your, your Cludger Engineer, that seems pretty good. This is a solid, like, very serviceable B+, plus A-, minus tag, so in all of the things you want and its remote presence, it is good. So, HI done, MI done, tags done, remotes. There are two remote profiles. Both of them are interesting, but the Moonraker is especially interesting. This is a forward deployment, camouflage, mimetism 3, mine layer, with a shotgun for 16 points. It is only ballistic skill 11, it has no armor, it does not have multiple wounds, it does have remote presence. Uh, this, this, but it is 16 points, it is regular, it is a mine layer, and it has both a shotgun and an ADHL. This thing slaps. Two of these, mine layers, straight in every list. Awesome. That gives you your ablative, defensive setup. These things, and this is one of the things, right? This is what differentiates, or one of the things that just so cleanly differentiates this faction from Invincible Army. You have a par excellence ablative screen that is normally a threat to anything. Like the fact that there's adhesive launchers hiding under camouflage markers means that you can't just run a tag forward. Like like one of them will detonate and be a mine, and then the other will fire a splooge grenade at you. And if you if you move move second move out of cover into line of fire of a camouflage marker in torchlight brigade, you better have balls of steel because that thing's going to have an adhesive launcher and it will shoot, and you're just going to have your tag bricked in the midfield. So like these things can close assault. Like they're four four, but they they are four deployment eight. There's going to be a point, some point in the game when one of the camouflage markers starts moving and it's got a heavy shotgun and it just runs at your link team that you parked in the midfield because you just ran out of orders for some reason or something. I don't know. Don't park midfield link teams in the midfield this thing is this thing is great now what this thing is not for example is a dash at libertos in terms of total potential of the scope of a game but who cares it's regular and the fact that it's regular means that if it does nothing that is totally fine the moonraker is is what like this piece is what i mean when i say the the like 15 to 17 point range in torchlight brigade is stacked and that is such a good points range to have great choices in because those great choices give you a great sectoral because you can then take all of your other cool stuff securing the knowledge that like you know what the moon rakers have freaking got this they're going to hold down the midfield i'm going to get my first turn these things are outstanding i was also talking before about the striders scouting forward unit those guys exist in the context of moon rakers because they are not alone in the midfield your opponent like if there's a there's a camouflage marker in the midfield in invincible army your opponent's like oh okay cool i know what that is if there are 
six camouflage markers in the midfield in Torchlight Brigade, your opponent's like, right, so there's two Moonrakers, so two of those things are mines. One of them's probably a Beast Hunter, so that's going to have a Heavy Flamethrower and CC and Mobility Skills. And then I guess the other is a Strider, which is, God knows what it's packing, because all those profiles are good. It might even have a Red Fury. Like, you have ambiguity. You have a Fog of War in your midfield because of these things. They are so good. They are seminal to release for the faction. I have exactly two models already painted that I will be using for these, and I'm deeply looking forward to it because they are wonderful. They are little smiley bots with big faces on them. Um, these things are outstanding. I cannot say enough good things about these. Slap two of these with Mind Layer in every single list as the starting point for a Torchlight list, and you will not be disappointed. They are just so useful. So our last and final piece that we're talking about for this sectoral, the final remote, is the Stormbot. And in the same way that the Moonraker plays with Striders, the Stormbot, in a much more janky way, plays with Yellow Jackets. This is the piece I was talking about where I, you, you maybe consider taking this and taking an Evo Hacker. Do I think it is outstanding? Do I think it is interesting? Yes. So what, what is this? This is a Ballistic Skill 13, base attack, plus one damage, two wound, armor three, BTS six, repeater, fat remote, silhouette four, six four remote. You can take it natively as a plus one burst HRL or pay a few points less and link it um, and, and it still get to ballistic, still, still get to burst three by slapping this thing in a link. That means high watermark, you have Ballistic Skill 13, burst three, plus one damage marksmanship HRL, which is, look, frankly, it's not outstanding, but it's only 28 points, and that is totally fine. You can build a list around good 28-point pieces. The 1.5 SWC is kind of a killer, but there are a few ways to cheapen your SWC load in this faction. You can take either LaCroix as your lieutenant, which is probably the jankier of the two options, or you can take a Silver Star Prime as your LT, which makes his HMG cheaper, and you can potentially maybe afford Stormbots. Three dice on 16, so a supplementary firepower piece for relatively cheap. That, look, if you need to, if you link it, you get the plus one in ARO. That's actually probably kind of reasonable. I'm not exactly sure what link I would take these in because you need, like, filling them out. It probably goes into a Cludger Engineer link where you have a Cludger Engineer, a Stormbot, and then, like, literally whatever the cheapest thing you can staple to it is, a Mint Agent, maybe? Um, that is... That is okay. Like, as a deployment zone, not going anywhere team, the Cludger is the most expensive thing that I don't want to pay for and kind of wouldn't. But otherwise, that is fine and makes the Stormbot more viable in ARO. Otherwise, you take these things as 28-point profiles and you run them You run them as, as just kind of like active turn pieces that an Evo Hacker will buff. And since you're taking an Evo Hacker, you just put a couple of Yellow Jackets or one Yellow Jacket in the list, and it's, it's not the end of the world. And you have so many camouflage markers that your opponent can't necessarily confirm that there is no yellow jacket. They can't confirm that there is a yellow jacket because you, you have a million camouflage markers in the midfield. I think if you take like a Strider Mine Layer and the two Moonrakers, you got six six um, camouflage markers off of three troopers. If you're running, like that is a pretty good disguise for a yellow jacket if you make that work. So I, I don't think the Stormbot is outstanding. I've already seen one person compare this to a Cyclone, and I think that is incredibly rich because Nomads, the, the comparison for me is a Vostok. And like, yes, a Vostok is more expensive, but it is a premier two-wound combat remote. Yes, it's only got a Mark 12, but the damn thing has Nomadism 6 and exists in Nomads. You can, like, any Nomad player that complains about the Stormbot is someone who has deep and unresolved trauma with the fact that they have one really, really good Silhouette 4 remote, and then just some bad ones that you probably shouldn't take, but they keep trying to anyway. Uh, there is one person this comment is aimed at, and if they've gotten this far in the video, they know exactly who I'm talking about. Please know that I respect you greatly, but you really do need to not compare this thing to a Cyclone. It will only make you sad. Comparison is the thief of joy. So yeah, Stormbots, uh, look, they are, they are probably going to be absolutely fantastic jank potential but there is there is a list there there is a list there that is the like engineer and structure thing where you have stormbots and you have your your moonrakers and you have your tag and all of this has structure so you have like one or two engineers sweating absolute bullets just trying to keep everything together you have your repeaters that way like that probably works as a list if you want to do mechanized torchlight the tools are there is it good no 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 probably not fantastic but is it playable 
yeah, probably. And that's kind of cool. So look, Stormbots get a firm, like, playable straight B. Not B+, plus, not B-, minus. nothing wrong with this as a piece. Is it outstanding? No. But is it playable? Yeah, in some lists, in an interesting, different, and kind of exciting way. That is, it's great that there are profiles like that in the sectoral. You can, you can play either the, like, clean, obvious, solid, or you can deviate towards other things. You want that in a sectoral design. So, one hour in almost exactly, that wraps up my review of the new Torchlight Brigade. Uh, overall, I would say, I don't know if this is necessarily going to be a sectoral for me. Put some more smoke grenades in the sectoral CV. Uh, don't actually do that. I think it needs its own identity, and an absence of smoke is part of that identity. If I want to pay 40 points for Hippolyta, I am welcome to do so, and who knows, I might at some point. She's pretty damn cool. Uh, this faction, though, this is interesting and exciting design there are if you if i was an invincible armies player if i was a uh, military orders player and i hadn't already experienced uh, utter destruction from my own envy when morats released uh, this would give me that kind of a response but any players of those factions have either made their peace with the existence of morats and therefore that there is a hi sectoral that is more fun and interesting than they are or they have not and and in which case this is just going to reinforce that trauma and that is kind of a shame but i think these guys are very very cool i think actually frankly now that i'm mentioning morats that is their like cleanest and almost obvious competitor and i think the two sectorals are probably going to be very closely balanced. I think they will fight very evenly against one another with similar strengths, similar weaknesses, and just enough different things going on. The Torchlight Brigade has like actual sick-ass midfield that the Morats are like, no, we're not allowed to have camouflage. But Morats have like slightly easier access to hacking and they have actual warbands. There is nothing, 40 points or thereabouts gets you a full Zerat, Preta, or like Gaki, or so Osnat, Preta, Gaki link team. And there is nothing in the entirety of Torchlight Brigade that comes close to that in terms of efficiency. But then once you get into the 15-point bracket, you're back to Moritz being like, well, that Arazi are very, very good. And let's not talk about Vanguard infantry. I'll take one as a paramedic and be sad if I have to take literally any more of them. Whereas the entirety of the 15-point range in this faction is incredible. So being like as cool and good as Moritz with the like big-ass hero good guy... Greco-Roman, look, let's just call them Ultramarines. If you want them to be Ultramarines, then they are that for you. Um, like the different vibe, the hero vibe, that is a solid addition to the game. I think they are going to be considerably more interesting to play against than some sectorals because they have clear and defined weaknesses. If you can neutralize the hackers, like you can, Wave Riders are not going to be too hard to neutralize that you can't establish fire hacking superiority against these guys. Their guns are not going to be so strong that you can't potentially establish firepower superiority. Like you have paths to victory against these guys, just as Torchlight Brigade have paths to victory against you. And they're not going to be doing, like, steel phalanx, I can't solve for Phoenix things. There's no individual piece in Torchlight Brigade that feels insurmountable. The high watermark, like, the number of orders that they can push through a Silver Star Link team, for example, I think falls short of, like, Invincible Army. But they are so much more well-rounded, they have more going on. There is a ton that is happening here. I like them a lot. I look forward to playing against them, like, much more, for example, than I would look forward to playing against steel phalanx, who are very challenging to deal with, despite the fact that they are an elite link team sectoral so yeah i overall i give this faction a like out the gate solid a the medium infantry is as good as medium infantry ever gets which is frankly not very good um but the heavy infantry the skirmishes the remotes even the tag and the backbone of the sectoral the stuff that that lets you actually play the game and stay in the game while your heroes go and get their first turn is all there and it is there in spades. So this is a solid A sectoral, although I will have to have an argument about that in, I don't know, a week or so's time when we actually do the next 2024 version of the Infinity the Game Factions tier list. As always, if you enjoyed this content, you can support the channel either through the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description or by becoming a channel member. Big thanks to the channel members who have become members already. It is your support that allows me to continue doing this because it is obviously quite a lot of effort. Nevertheless, I deeply enjoyed talking about this sectoral for, at this point, uh, more than an hour, and I look forward to having a game with them soon. That will ideally be a battle report, so we will get to see how they play in real time. Uh, as always, deeply enjoyed this, hope you did too, and I will see you next time.